Okay, so thank you for attending. And uh, what I would like to talk about today uh, is a collection of results uh, about how to enforce constraints for the uh, three major modes of learning, which is uh, supervised and supervised reinforcement learning. And then the fourth thing that is on the title there, continual learning, I, as you will see, I don't have a better title for it, is how to continue training. So instead of doing one-time learning, how can you continue training if you have data coming in? So uh, this work has been supported uh, over the last few years, first by internal funding by PNNL and currently by the FILMS project uh, from DOE Oscar. FILMS stands for Physics Informed Learning Machines. Okay, now let's go, oh, where is it? Why won't it go forward? Okay, so let's start with what is actually that we want to do. We suppose that we're given a dynamical system and we have time series data. And what we want to learn from this time series data is a flow map of the dynamical system, which means that we want to learn a map that when you're given the state of the system at one time, as an input, it can output the state of the system after some time, for example, an interval delta t, okay? And uh, in the things that, uh, in the constructions that I will present, uh, we can assume that the time series data can be sequential or it can, have, it can be allowed to have gaps, which is a more difficult case. However, it's also a more realistic case because you may have uh, situations where you have a sensor that is not working very well, so it can only give you uh, data in gaps. And the third bullet here says that successful prediction, which means using the flow map, the trained flow map to actually do predictions, can benefit from an error correcting mechanism. What does this mean? Uh, if we're, since this is a machine learning workshop, as you expect, the idea is to approximate the flow map by some uh, neural network. And what is an error correcting mechanism in this case? What happens is that even if you train your network uh, on some time series data, unless you have many, many data and you have a very powerful network, when you try to use this neural network iteratively to produce, let's say, the trajectory of a dynamical system, every time you apply this neural network uh, representation of the map, you commit some error. So what can happen is that quickly you can find yourself in an area of state space or even phase space where the neural network has not trained before. And what can happen then is that the neural network can quickly lose its predictive ability. So an error correcting mechanism would be some way to use the information that you have from the dynamics in order to bring your predicted, predictive trajectory back to where it should be. And this information can be incorporated in the network, whether you, uh, in two ways, it can come from a continuous uh, formulation of the dynamical system, or as you can see, as you will see later, it can come also from discrete time formulations, meaning what you get if you discretize your dynamical system by some numerical method. And there is a very interesting connection between this, the concept of this error correcting mechanism and the concept of memory in model reduction, renormalization, but in a temporal sense, because here, remember that we're trying to estimate the map of a system, the flow map. So because we're using a discrete time step, it means that we're not resolving the time scales that are smaller, that are shorter than the, than the time step that we are using for our flow map. So uh, basically the error correcting mechanism is a way to try to account for the activity in these time scales that you're not explicitly resolving. So in this sense, uh, there is a connection with the concept of renormalization, but as I said, in a temporal sense. And then the third one is that exactly because it is an error correcting mechanism, you can think of it also as trying to learn some kind of a control in the, uh, that will bring the predicted trajectory back to where it should be. Okay, so let's start first with the case of supervised learning to uh, see what we're 
looking at here, let's suppose that we are given a data uh, points from one to capital lambda, xi data. And these are given from some dynamical system, dx dt is equal to f of x. I have kept here x uh, as a scalar, but this thing generalizes to uh, higher dimensions. It's just so that I don't carry around too many indices. And uh, in, in supervised learning, what are you trying to do? Let's assume that you have your flow map represented by a neural network, which here would be this capital G, standing from generator. So that's what the capital G is from. And what you would like to do is you would like to take as inputs some ZI here, which are basically the state of the system at the previous uh, time step. And you want to put it through the neural network and get an estimate G of ZI, which is the state of the system after some time delta T, okay? And in supervised learning, exactly because you have the data XI data, you try, for example, to minimize uh, your loss, which is given by this uh, expression here, a quadratic loss. So you can do that. There is no problem. You can do that. You don't need any constraints. So let's look at a very simple problem here, and then I'll say how and what kind of constraints we can introduce. So a very simple problem is to take the Lorentz model and which is a three-dimensional uh, system and you try to train uh, the flow map for this system and in this particular case i have used data in the interval from zero to three okay starting away from the attractor and then what i want to do is after i do my training i want to use the initial condition with this trained flow map to go all the way from zero up to time nine okay and not only that, but I would like to use as my prediction step, a hundred, I've used a much larger time step than the ground truth. So this is, this is, this is a, it's a little tough case, okay? And what you do, what you see on the left is that if you don't apply any constraints, you can train quickly a network, okay? And what, can, what happens when you try to do prediction, a typical situation is this, that you, Initially, the, so the, the blue here is the ground truth and the red, the red crosses are the predictions from the network. So at the beginning, it follows nicely the trajectory. And then at some point, you see here this straight line, basically what happens is that it loses all predictive ability. It goes on to the attractor and then it stops there. It doesn't know what to do, okay? So, what, what is the problem? The problem is that if you are on the attractor, okay, you need information about small movements and not just the large movements of transitioning to the attractor. So there you need local information about how to go around the attractor. And one way that you can do that is through a continuous time formulation in the following way. Let's look at this loss function, which has the superscript constraints. You say, okay, what do I do in supervised learning? I want the output of my neural network at the next step to be equal to the training data. But that's just saying, okay, I want the neural network to reach the correct point at the next time step. But why stop there? You don't, even, you don't only want to reach the correct point, but you would like to reach the correct point with the correct velocity so that then you know how to move next. And how do you do that? An easy way to doing it is instead of just enforcing in your loss function agreement over the states, you can also enforce agreement over the velocities themselves, which involve the right hand side. And you can do that just by adding this term. And if you try to do that, you will get something that is not training actually. So it's unstable. And the reason is very simple is that even that the values of these errors here that have to do with the derivatives are much, much larger usually than the values of these errors. So in other words, you need some way to balance them so that you get something that trains. And a crude way, which has actually for the problems I have tried, it works well, is to use an annealing parameter in front, this parameter lambda here. And this annealing parameter means that it can start from zero at the beginning of the training and slowly go all the way up to one and if you do that, you get something that basically trains at the same time for the same amount of iterations, but it behaves much better. And as you can see here, uh, 
you don't only you don't only get to the attractor, but you can actually follow what happens on the attractor up, of course, to a point. Okay, if you want to get transitions between the two lobes of the Lorentz attractor, you will have to do more work. This is I will show you later. Okay, so this is one case for the case of supervised learning. Of course, you can go into much more detail about this. It can become a small project of its own. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next one. I just have a, yes. I just have a, I just have a yes. quick question, yeah. Yes, yes. So it's a little unclear this, um, this term you're adding because at some level, if you know, xi data matches g of zi, yes. then the the f's are also going to match. Well, so yeah, but they're never exactly right, but they're never exactly zero, right? I mean, the, these differences are never exactly zero. So, in other words, if you make a small error in matching g, the error in matching f can be quite large. So, so, right, so, you, so you're making, so what are the assumptions you're making on F really? I mean, like what? What are, what, um, what was the question? Well, what, what sort of assumption you're making of, for example, if F is linear, clearly yes. that, 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 that's the same thing. Right, so right, right. But the yes, yes, of F. Right, right. If F, if F is linear, yes, then, I mean, then, then it's, it's just a, a scaled version of the first term. I mean, it's not... Uh, Right. Yes. So I'm saying, so if F is nonlinear, yes. then in how, how how do you understand the this contribution from from F or yes, or you're trying to you're, you're, match the yes, you're trying to match the velocities too, not just the, the point itself, but the velocity too. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's the way okay. I mean, right. okay. I, okay. I, I I view it. Okay. And uh, by by the way, all of these things that I will present here they can become small projects of, of their own. If for any of them you're interested, please contact me and we can talk more. So the next uh, part, the, uh, the next part has to do, where is it here? Uh, with unsupervised learning. So in particular, the generative adversarial networks or GANs, which have become very popular. And how do this work? This work in the following way, you get, uh, basically a generator like before, but now you also have a discriminator and you make them uh, play a game against each other so that the generator tries to fool the discriminator that its output is actually the real thing and not just a fake. And so in this particular case, how can you actually add constraints? Well, if you want to respect the game theoretic setup, an easy way, easy, in, qu in quotation marks to add uh, the constraint is not to add the constraints themselves, but the constraint residuals, meaning how well does the uh, output of the network satisfy the constraint and you can use them to augment the discriminator input. Okay, so in this way, this means that instead of having the original uh, setup uh, with the cost function uh, V, that you have in the original formulation of GANs. Now you have a V constraints, which as you can see here for the discriminator, when it is estimated uh, from the true data and from the generator output, you have an extra term here, this epsilon, which is the residual constraint. And similarly here for the generator output. Now, uh, just a word of caution, that even when you try this for very simple cases, you will find something that is interesting. That uh, you, re you do respect the game theoretic setup, but both in the case when you enforce the constraints like here, or you don't enforce the constraints, even for very simple problems as a function of iterations, even though you can reach the game theoretic uh, optimum, when it comes to the actual uh, uh, quality of your network, into satisfying the constraints themselves uh, or into being predictive, uh, there is a big difference whether you satisfy the constraints or not. What do I mean by that? That if you actually look at the relative error in the output of your network uh, based on what you want it to do, if you satisfy the constraints, which is the black line here, 
you see that the relative error goes, goes down much faster. And in fact, it converges. That's why this, this line stops here, okay? So basically for this problem, uh, you have converged by the time you've reached 10,000 iterations. While if you don't enforce the constraints, uh, you can go on and on and on trying to, to get down to the, to satisfy some tolerance uh, criterion. And here in this particular example, it stopped at around 70,000 iterations because the, the time step uh, for your gradient descent, the learning rate had become just too, too small. So this is just a word of caution. You can find more details in this uh, publication here, but now let's see how we can actually apply this when we want to enforce constraints from a dynamical system. So let's go back to our problem of enforcing constraints. What, what is the big difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is that in unsupervised learning, we cannot enforce the agreement of the value of a function as computed from the generator and the true data. This is why it is unsupervised because you don't have labeled data, okay? So enforcing constraints has to be done self-consistently on the output of the generator, which means that if you want to enforce constraints, all you have is the output of the generator and you have to make do with that, okay? So there are two ways if you want to enforce constraints that come from a dynamical system like before. The first approach is that you can augment the generator input and output by the rate of change of the state. So in other words, you will train a generator not just to take as input the state of the system and produce the output, but it will take as input both the state and the rate of change, and it will output, of course, both the state of the system and the rate of change of the state. If you try to do that, you can make it work sometimes. The problem is, again, that because you can have very different orders of magnitude between the state and the rate of change of the state, when it comes to Gantz, they can be very flaky and very unstable. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend this. However, there is a second approach will act, which will actually is, I find it interesting, which is the following. Suppose that you can only use the state of the system. How can you enforce a constraint that comes from the dynamical system? Well, in this case, you can discretize the equation so that the constraint involves only the state. So for example, if we go back to our uh, uh, system here, this dx dt is equal to f of x, let's assume the simpler case that you discretize this derivative with some Euler scheme, okay? So, and then you say, okay, my residual constraint would be that I would like, for example, the output of my network to, to be close to the Euler discretization. But this, as you expect, is not something that will work very well. And it is obvious why. Because you don't know, first of all, that your data come from the Euler method. But even if you did, exactly because when you discretize, you create an error, okay, you have to find a way to correct this error. So if you just try to use as uh, residual, the first three terms here, the g of uh, z of y and the rest which come from the Euler method, you will train something that basically is, is not very good. However, what you can do is that you can add this correction term here, okay, which involves a parameter of its own, which is a trainable parameter, which can be trained along with the generator. So the way to think about that is, this is a, the simplest possible case where this term is a linear term, okay? The simplest way to, to think about this is that you can think of it as a memory term. You can think of it as a modified uh, numerical method. You can think of it as a normalization, like I said before, or you can think of it as a, as a control, okay? And this parameter mu that you train along with the network is a parameter that tells you how strong this correction should be so that the, uh, you minimize this residual epsilon. 
Now, uh, so these are the bullets that I have here. And like I said, this is the simplest possible case where you use a linear correction term, but nothing stops you from making actually the correction to be a neural network itself, okay? Things like that have also appeared in hybrid modeling where people use neural networks, where they assume that they have some subgrid term that can be expressed, for example, uh, through a neural network. I don't necessarily recommend just using a powerful neural network there because again, like uh, Eric pointed also uh, during the previous talk, when you go to neural networks, sometimes you have no guarantees uh, for stability and so on. So let's see again for this Lorentz problem, how would this uh, setup work? And- Well, Panos, just yes. a quick question here. Yes, yes. Um, so, so here I can see that the epsilon is one of the terms that's going to show up in the discriminator, right? Uh, yes, yes. Right, but in terms of the prediction, Yes. Like to to integrate the the equations. Yes. What what exactly are you using? Using g plus epsilon or what is it? To to what do you mean pre predict? You mean the 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 map itself? It's just right. G, yeah. It's just g. You, so if I want to do a prediction, I start with an initial condition and I plug it into g, okay, and then I apply it iteratively. I don't add a correction. So in other words this correction term here is only for the training. It's not actually used anywhere else. It's not used from the, by the generator if you want to produce a trajectory. It's just part of the training. Okay, so you're saying by adding epsilon, you're basically cha indirectly changing G. Yes, yes. So basically what you say is that by using this extra, let's say, correction term, you force the parameters of the of the neural network, the, the the weights and the biases, to train in a way that they respect this correction too. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. So it's like a putting a correction which is in, in a self consistent way that that's why you have a parameter that also trains together with the generator. Now, the interesting thing is that actually this parameter, at least from some results that I have seen, is that it has nice scaling properties that are related to the, the size, the, the time step. So there is a lot of structure there and it needs it, it, it waiting to be uncovered. So if you don't enforce constraints, this again, like I said, this is guns. If we tried the, the same thing like before, uh, if you don't enforce constraints and you train through, through guns, you get something that works for a while and then it becomes unpredictive. If you do enforce the constraints in this setup, like I said, with the crude Euler method and the, the simple correction, it becomes much better. I know it's, it still needs improvement, but this is... Uh, yeah, this uh, guns can be... Uh, pretty stubborn when it comes to, and delicate when it comes to, to training. So uh, anyway, this, this is the, re the result for now. And now let's move, because we don't have all so much time, let's move to the case of reinforcement uh, learning. So for reinforcement learning, and in particular for actor critic methods, what you can do is the following. For act so for actor critic methods, you have the actor, which is the action policy, and you have the critic, which is the uh, action value function, which evaluates how, how each uh, uh, action that you take. And in this particular case, if you want to learn the flow map, the map can be taken to be the action policy itself. And the constraints, if you want to add them, they can be added in the reward function, which is this R of T here. So if you try to train uh, networks with an actor critic method, uh, they can be extremely delicate. This is well known and documented. And in particular, you can, you can get into trouble with the whole training being unstable. And even if it's stable, it can be extremely inaccurate. So people have come up with all sorts of ways of 
stabilizing and making this thing accurate. And sometimes when it works, it is spectacularly good, actually. So the way that I approach this thing is that because I'm not a machine learning person and I don't know these things well, so I went in a different way and I said, okay, what are we actually doing here? So in the actor uh, critic method, what you have is you have basically a bi-level optimization problem. And the first level has to do with capital Q, which is the action value function. And the second level has to do with mu, which is the action policy, which as I said, we're taking the map to be the action policy. And instead of solving each one of these two optimization problems to convergence, what you do is you do one iteration of uh, updating capital Q and then one iteration of updating capital mu, uh, of updating the small mu here, okay? But this, if you actually look at what you're trying to do is that you're trying to make capital Q close to this Y of T, which is called the target function. And the target function contains all the information that you have from the data. And then you try to take this new estimate of capital Q and actually uh, optimize its value in order to get the action policy. So this is a very inefficient way of bringing any information that you have from the reward function to inform the action policy. In particular, you can think about it. If you think of the target function Y and Q in function space as two axes, what you're trying to do is you know that your answer would be a straight line where in this, uh, where Q is equal to Y, the target function, but basically whenever you initialize your training, you throw random pins in a two dimensional plane trying to hit a line, okay? This is extremely inefficient. If it works, fine, but usually it doesn't work. So what you can do is the following. You say, why don't I help myself by starting the optimization from a, from a better point? So what you can do is that for the second part of the optimization that has to do with the action policy, instead of using directly the capital Q, you can start with Y of T. You can actually start with the target, okay? And you can introduce this simple convex combination of the two. And this parameter delta here is a parameter that is annealed from zero to one during training. And why do you want to do that? Because if you just start with this and keep this for all time, then you can play with inequalities around and you can show that the estimate that you will get for the action value function is only a lower bound. So if you want to bound it from above, you also have to make extra assumptions, which if you don't have to make, why make them? So instead of just starting and staying with the target function for all time, you should anneal to get back to the original function. And this thing, turns out to work very well, at least for this problem. You can find more details in this preprint. And what you have here on the left is the case where you don't enforce any constraints, okay? And what you have on the right is the case where you do enforce constraints. I just want to say that again, blue is the ground truth, red is the prediction from uh, the train network with this uh, homotopy or annealing. And the green line is as bad as it seems. If you don't use homotopy, you can stabilize, for example, your uh, training, but the prediction is really poor. You can look at this thing here. I mean, it really has no predictive ability. So a lot more can be said about that, but since we're running out of time, let me just go to the next last part, which has to do with the continual learning. So you can take all these three methods that I described before, these three approaches, and you can make online versions of them. Why would you want to do that? Because you can have, for example, information that comes in in the, in the form of new measurements. And what you would like to do is that you would like to keep training parameters, uh, the weights and biases of the network so that you can capture local information as it changes, okay? And let's see this very simple example for Lorenz. What I have here on the left is what I call one-time learning. In this particular case, I take a time series from time zero all the way to time 25 here, and I feed it into the training, and I train my network, and then I start from time zero, and I want to, to 
uh, predict the trajectory all the way to 25. This is the green here, the network prediction. As you see, after a little bit of time, it starts actually deviating a lot. And you can, in fact, if you look, if you look at the relative error, relative error of one means 100% error here. Okay, so, uh, so in other words, you can actually train the thing, but it's not accurate at all. On the other hand, what I call here continual learning, what you do is that you train for a while and then you create these small chunks of data that you bring in and you retrain your network. So if you do that, then you are able to capture well, not just the initial transition to the attractor, but you can capture well the transitions between the two lobes of, of, the, of the Lorentz attractor. So, and there are a lot more details in this, but we don't have much time. So let me just finish here by giving a few directions for current and future work, because there are a lot more details that need to be worked out. First of all, uh, it would be interesting to explore the enforcing of constraints for reinforcement learning. And the reason is the following that uh, I didn't have time to talk about that, but you can actually, instead of just enforcing the constraint, you can also add some noise to the training data, which is in the sense of exploration in reinforcement learning. And uh, the reinforcement learning setup has this exploration uh, already built in, in its formulation. And this is exactly this expectation that you see here with respect to the state of time t. And this parameter, this uh, distribution here is uh, how you can add some noise to the data. And the second is that when it comes to the continual training approach, here there are, first of all, there is the, the, the question, how often should you retrain? Of course, this is related uh, basically to how unstable are, how unstable is your, uh, how, if you want to say how chaotic is your underlying system. So you can actually decide on the frequency of training through uh, the use of, if you have access, let's say, to the Lyapunov exponents. And however, there is an extra thing which is interesting, that there is a trade-off between the frequency of observations and the need for explicit enforcing of an error correction mechanism, which means that if you, if you have enough data, you do not necessarily have to enforce a constraint too. However, if you only have sparse data, then enforcing an error correction mechanism be becomes very important. And the last thing here is something that I mentioned before about the form of the constraints themselves, that there appear to be scaling laws that these parameters that show up in the correction term, uh, they appear to have scaling laws in the time step, which is, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of incomplete similarity, which means that there is a lot of structure underneath uh, this uh, correction term. And that would be something interesting to explore. So if you have questions and you want to get some answers, not all the answers, because I also have many questions myself, you can write, uh, you can send me an email. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. awesome. Uh, so yeah, if you have questions, you can again, you know, uh, put in the chat or- uh, Yes, yes, and, and or later you talking. can yes, send me an email if you- so I just had a quick question about your reinforcement yes. learning. Can you go back a couple of slides? Um, yes. I, I just missed, uh, you get this homotopy annealing method. Yes. Um, but where the explicit error correction, so wh where is that? I, I didn't get oh. that. Oh, that, yes. That so, yeah. right. So, so, so that part would be in here in the reward function. So in the reward I function, see. you could, you, you would get uh, a term think of it uh, this way. You can have this thing as in the reward function. Right, 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 yes. Right, okay. Yes. So, so error like I said, error on the for, 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 yeah. for me, I mean, the way using reinforcement learning like that, someone may think that, okay, reinforcement learning is not exactly why is it's made for not to deal with problems like that. But because I, I was not a machine learning person, I just wanted to see if I can use also reinforcement learning to do this problem. So.
Hi, hello. And, and of course, uh, in, in you, yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, Kyle, yeah. Uh, Kyle, uh, you have a yeah, this is the Kyle from Stanford. I have a oh, question hi. about yes. the, uh, your equation on, on, on page three. Uh, you said that you use the annealing method to choose the pra parameter. Can you explain more about that? Oh, yes. So here, so this is, like I said, uh, a lot more needs to be done is into how you actually choose this parameter. I have found that it is pretty robust for this particular example that you see here, yeah. the way that I have used the annealing, just use a simple sigmoid function that goes from zero to one. Okay. Okay. And, and when I say that it is robust, it is robust in the sense that if you, uh, you choose, for example, how fast this thing will go from zero to one, right? In, as, as a function of the iterations, it is robust in the sense that if you get the order of magnitude of iterations and how fast this thing should go from zero to one, it is enough. In other words, you can say that it needs a thousand iterations. You don't have to optimize and say that it needs, you know, 2,314. Otherwise it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. okay. So in this respect, it's not sensitive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, uh -oh. so, uh, a, a complementary approach to this, which has to do with PDEs, is what Paris will talk about in the afternoon, where uh, instead, of, in, in, instead of anchoring things on these observations and putting in slowly these constraints that have to do with the right-hand side of the equations, you go the other way. You anchor things on the residual about the dynamics, and then you bring in the observations through uh, some parameter. You will see, I mean, in the afternoon when, when Paris talks about this. And underneath all of these things is uh, some kind of stiffness that has to do with learning rate. And uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so how do you choose the scale of lambda? Because, for example, the x might range from zero to one million, and the f x might range from zero to one. So yes. they do not have the same scale. If in that yes, case, you yes, do just the yeah, lambda to be one. Right. So the the underlying idea is that you allow first to explore the information that is in the data. And you do that slowly enough. So you bring this information slowly enough so that by the time this lambda goes to one, everything that the data had to give you, they have already given you. Okay. So then you can bring in the information about the velocity to make small refinements. Okay. Into the, into the training map. Uh, okay. So, th th so think of it as learning in, in two ways in two levels of resolution. First, you learn the course. The course features is how to get the information from the state uh, the, itself. And then you bring in the information from the velocity. OK, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. OK, hey, so we have a, a question from uh, Ashkan in the, uh, he, he posted a message no, in yes. the chat. So uh, just, just quickly, yeah. can, can you introduce yeah, yourself yeah, and answer yeah. your question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm Ashkin from MIT. I have a quick question. Um, so regarding the reinforcement learning part, isn't it? Uh, so what you're doing is essentially uh, very similar, pretty much the same as having like two different uh, networks, right? So instead of having Q pr parameterized by one mu, you can have uh, a Q, two Qs parameterized by two different mu's. And in one of the mu uh, goes, uh, actually, uh, uh, you will have two different, uh, uh, actually, slow and, and, and fast uh, learning rates for, for these two uh, networks. And, and by doing so, uh, you can actually explore the data uh, first uh, in, in learning the, uh, the Q, right? In learning the mu, actually. When you say Two, two networks, are you talking about something else ad, other than the target networks? Uh, You're not talking about target <laughs> networks, right? So Where, you will have two different, you will have two different um, uh, target networks. One will be for 
the first line and the other will be for the second. So you will have two queues. One queue will be parameters by- Okay, but how do you connect, how, how do you connect the, the two queues? If you're using different for the first line and different for the second line? Yes, yes, you will. So there will be essentially, uh, uh, so one, one of the networks will actually follow the other one. We, we, okay, can you make this a little bit more? <laughs> so this is actually, this is a very well documented, so it's double Q uh, network in reinforcement learning. And I, and I think it's in, in essence, it's very similar to what you're doing. I just okay. want Okay. Yeah, it's, but, but this is a, um, uh, it's, it's what you're saying is more general, I would say. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I looked around because when I when I did this thing, I said, "Oh, come on! It's an annealing idea about yes, exactly. the, the action value function." So I looked around. I couldn't find something similar, but maybe I couldn't find something similar because the way that it is expressed is not the way that I was looking for it. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, when, when you have just one cube. Um, as you said, yes, you're trying to learn something, but at the same time, that, that something is changing. Exactly, and, 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 and that's the problem. It, is, that, it actually yes, makes it unstable. It's unstable. I mean, it's, a, it's the usual issue with the Bellman equation when you try to solve exactly. it. But, but exactly. yeah, okay, so can you- I can send you the email, I can send you, I, I can yes. shoot you an email with, the, with that paper. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Like I said, I'm not, I came from a different domain, so I, was not at all yeah, uh, me too, familiar <laughs> with this with this literature. So I just looked around. I couldn't find anything similar. I said, "Okay, I'll do it this way." <laughs> sure, sure. I'll, yeah. I'll send you the paper. Yeah. The one good okay. thing is that, that there is a, indeed a dramatic uh, improvement in the in the quality of the training when you actually do that. So exactly. Yeah. yeah.